So after looking at poll inspection process, uh, let us now move on to talk about serviceability criteria. Now, for those of you who don't know already, uh, or that just um, you know coincidentally stumbled onto this video from Google or something, this video is actually part of a playlist that contains all the videos for this wood pole inspection course. So if you're interested in viewing the entire course for free, please visit the playlist link that I've left in the YouTube video description below. So let's get started for the serviceability criteria. Now, the principal reason in diminishing the load carrying capacity of an in-service pole is the loss of cross-section due to decay or deterioration. As a result, the best method for assessing whether an in-service wood pole can carry the desired load is to do a complete structural study along with an accurate assessment of its current state. Simplified serviceability criteria based on the loss in strength notion can be established as a first level approach. Now, based on current design practice, an in-service pole with no decay or defect can be assumed to support the present connection with a certain level of reliability under expected load conditions. After all, the pole was designed installed for that particular purpose. As a result, the pole's original diameter at the defect or damage site can be used as a reference circumference. As a result of the decrease of load carrying capability owing to decay or rot, the reliability of course will suffer. The pole is judged safe without replacement or refurbishment if this reduced degree of reliability is proved to be acceptable. In terms of load factors, this tolerable threshold is stated explicitly in various national statutes. The load factor for installation denotes the safety of newly installed poles, but the load factor for replacement denotes a weight carrying capability limitation. As a result, the ratio of these load factors can be utilized to calculate the permitted percentage of load bearing capacity reduction. And this reduction is estimated to be 35% conservatively, allowing defect size for various scenarios are determined using this criterion. Next, we should talk about what is the general procedure. Please note that this is an example of the evaluation process and the inspector must confirm the various requirements with each utility separately. Now that we went over this short disclaimer, uh, the pole inspector should take the following steps as shown in front of you right now. First, you need to take a measurement of the pole circumference at any external or interior pocket, typically at the ground line. Then you should also measure the original circumference of the ground line and then remove the shell rod to measure the circumference if the pole has extensive shell rod below or above the ground line and compare it to the lowest permissible, which corresponds to the original circumference. And the original circumference can be found in um, the standard that I've mentioned in a previous video. So be sure to check that out. Secondly, measure the circumference directly above the shaved area, but closer to the ground line. If the original ground line circumference has been reduced due to previous inspection through removal of exterior shell rot, if the shaved air length extends above the ground line, however, the circumference can be determined by utilizing the CSA 015 or NC05 pole classification tables, knowing the species, pole class, and pole height from the pole tag. Thirdly, you should also take a measurement of any external pocket depth uh, and width and determining the external pocket's location in relation to the line direction, whether in line or out of line or at another location. Now, as for the fourth step, you should identify the position of any internal rot with respect to the line direction by measuring the effective shell thickness. Reduce the measurements by a factor of 0.7 if drilling must be done at a 45 degree angle to the pole near the ground line. Fifth, if a cross section has either internal rot or an external pocket, you should compare the measured defect size for the external pocket or for the internal rot to the allowable defect size, which corresponds to the original circumference measured at the defect location. And lastly, if an external pocket and interior rot are present at the same cross section, you should compare the measured pocket width to the limiting width value corresponding to the measured effective shell thickness and the original circumference. For the tables and the limiting values mentioned, um, you, will, you will actually uh, uh, be able to find it in the standard that I mentioned in a previous video. Um, 
but you know what as if you forgot already you or you haven't jotted down um, you should actually get a copy of the CSA 015 or the ANSI 05 for these data so be sure to get that if you're going to utilize any of the information that I am teaching you in this course now before we move on further into our course let us take a brief look at our sponsor for this course now as an engineer especially when I first started in my career I really felt overwhelmed the list of documents that we need to do on top of our technical work Yet, these documents are very important in our career as it is the more prominent thing that displays our credibility to management and to our clients if we so decide to become an engineer consultant, which is where the real actual money is. Now, I don't have these tools available to me when I first started my career, but now PM Milestone has created this package of all the professional templates that you need so that you can focus more on the technical aspect of your career. These templates are tried and tested by real professionals, so you should feel confident in using them in your career to present your best foot forward in front of your manager or clients. These templates are also updated periodically, and I think their last update is just 2021, so they're not going to be out of date or context to the present times as these people are serious in getting the most professional product to meet your needs. They're also very confident of the quality of these templates too, as they offer you their product completely risk-free with 60-day money-back guarantee if you are not satisfied with it. So, if you are interested in this product and would also like to support me in creating these courses on YouTube in the future, please check out their product using the link in my video description titled Course Sponsor PM Milestone 2.0. So how do you determine when the poll is suitable for servicing? Well, when the following conditions that are shown in front of you apply, the poll is appropriate for servicing. So in this case, let us go over the conditions. First of all, climbing the pole shell should be risk-free. Second condition is that there are no decay or damage is discovered or that the decay or damage is within the allowed limitations as set by the standards. Third, the effective shell thickness is more than two inches above and below the ground line. And lastly, the circumference measured is greater than the minimum permitted circumference as outlined in the standards. And the standards that I mentioned is the CSA 015 or the ANSI 05. And likewise, the pole is appropriate for stubbing if it is in a good condition above ground and the following conditions are met, which one being that the pole is rotted below the excavation's bottom, which means that there's a deep decay, but the upper body is in good, good shape. However, though, it is time to replace your pole if you experience any of the following, which uh, which is that uh, there is extensive physical destruction above ground and that the effective shell thickness above ground is less than the limiting value as outlined by those CSA or ANSI standard. As mentioned in the introduction of this course, I highly recommend you to take my Distribution Power Engineering Fundamentals course or the Transmission and Distribution Line Infrastructure Fundamentals course to gain core knowledge of the distribution power poles that we're looking at in this course. These two courses will provide you not only the prerequisite knowledge that you need to understand what I'm talking about in this course better, but also provide you with essential industry knowledge that will no doubt help you propel your career to the next level. Also, upon completion of the courses, you will get a certificate of completion, which you can show to your current or potential employer that you have mastered these fundamental concepts. I have left the links to my two courses in the video description below, so be sure to check it out. Also, this video is part of a playlist that contains all the videos for this wood pole inspection course, so if you are interested in viewing the entire course, please visit the playlist link that I have left in the video description below. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in my other videos.